This is the basic cross section uh, of the tank. And essentially we have an all plastic tank with insulation around the tank and on the top we have three miles of plastic tubing inside of each tank. The tubing only takes up 10% of the total volume of that tank. Uh, so 10% is the heat exchanger, 80% is water, mm -hmm. and you fill it up to here and then the next 10% is expansion space because when you freeze the water to ice it takes up more room. And you said this is plastic construction so it's, it's not... All pla it's all polyethylene. But it still gives you uh, uh, it gives you the so flexibility, it's durable material. In fact, 95% uh, of the natural gas pipelines mm -hmm. now that snake across the five continents are made of polyethylene, it's polyethylene really? pipe. And this is uh, recyclable in terms yeah, of... Yeah, 100% yes. recyclable. I mean, it's the same material that your milk containers are, right? I okay. mean, easily recyclable. So we've got tanks that are in uh, 34 years now, mm -hmm. uh, still going strong. That's what people were asking. They were like, how, what, how do you deal with the expansion? You know, because you're thinking metal, you're like, right. you know, like right. ice will crush yeah. it in a, in, a, in a second. The other question that you usually get on the technical side from the engineers is, well, how can you use plastic mm -hmm. for heat transfer? Well, the big resistor in this thermal heat transfer is not the tube wall. Right? It's not the plastic. It's not the thin plastic. It's the stagnant water mm -hmm. that you have. So we designed it so we don't have a lot of the water. We're only making about a half inch of ice mm -hmm. uh, within the tank from yeah. each surface of the tube. So the tube material, you could make this out of copper. It would not perform any better once you've got that first, you know, quarter inch, eighth inch of ice on there. So come on out, we'll take a, take a look. So we have the tubing made outside and the tubing goes onto what we call a creel. We weld a, a header pipe on the inside, uh, two header pipes on the inside, and then there's two header pipes that we put on the outside. So what we do is we get counterflow within each level of the tubing. So if you have 25 degree solution going in this end, comes out the other end just below 32, so call it 31. Okay. So on this end of the tube, you're gonna make a lot of ice because you got doing that for 10 hours. Yes. But on the other end, it's coming out of 31, so you're not going to make a lot of ice. Well, the next tube next to it, it's the exact opposite. Coming in the opposite way. So we got a lot of ice on the other end of that tube. And so when we spiral it up, we're making uniformly ice. You put your fingers around any two tubes. Yes. We got the same amount of ice, whether you're making or discharging ice. So are you doing some type of radio frequency welding or ultrasonic? No, or? actually, it is a thermal weld. I can show you that over here. This would be a cap. And the first thing you do is you plane the surface off. You put it here, you put the cap, you put the pipe, and you plane both areas, and then you take the plane out, you put the heater in, and you press the material on that for about 30 seconds. Okay. You take the iron out, it presses together, and when it pushes together, it's very molten, so it kind of rolls back a little bit. Wow. And that's your joint, right? That's your weld right there. Yeah. Now, you could take a sledgehammer mm -hmm. to this all day long, hit this, hit this, <laughs> and you're not going to break. You're not gonna break the polyethylene. The counterflow in, uh, in the, uh, the weld, was that something that was a part of like the original design, or is that something no, that No, actually, the original design was done with the mechanical fitting. Okay. Um, and then in 1999, we went to the all-welded heat exchanger, okay. and that made a that made a huge difference. If this is all like polyethylene compared compared to metal, this has got to be super light. And well, once you put it in the well, yeah. uh, once I mean, you the put water it in, ice, and you yeah. add the water, yeah. you know now you go from 1,800 pounds to 18,000 pounds. Okay, Too so bad. that's heavy, but. Yeah. For instance, the TIA Craft Building, yes. all right, the tanks are on the 28th floor of mm -hmm. an existing building. So you can put them on the roof, you can put them in the basement, uh, and these older buildings, they can hold the weight. You just have to distribute the, to, the, to the columns. The buildings that have to stay up and running, like hospitals or you know, centers, all the, because of uh, resiliency rule laws that are going into effect, stuff has to come out of the basement. So the chillers are yeah. coming out of the basement, right? They're going yeah. onto the second floor yeah, in, in all the hospitals, right? Yes. That was, um, I'm assuming, because of Superstorm Sandy and a lot of systems yeah. went because, down? Because, yeah, uh, exactly. We had delivered only a month before 120 tanks. Both buildings totally flooded. So our tanks were 
50 feet underwater. The sewage pumps all failed, so you had crap and you had you know, fuel. Uh, it was nasty yes. down yes. there. So they pumped these out, cleaned them out. We supplied flatbed trucks. They took them out, put them on the trucks, brought them back here. We were able to reuse the exact same, 80% of the exact same materials. The tanks were fine, heat exchange were fine, and the only real waste was the insulation because the fuel oil attacked the foam insulation, Correct. right? So 99% of that was either recycled or reused and in perfect mint, mint condition. The um, shells themselves, are they extruded as no. one piece or are you... Uh, I'll show you well, that in a minute. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> so the covers uh, and the tanks are what's called rotationally molded. You have a steel mold with a gas flame on the outside. We heat it up, we have powdered plastic tumbling around in there, and we create the, the shape. Everywhere you see black, there's a quarter inch of black material. Mm -hmm. And then where there's a gap between here and here, there's an air gap in there which gets foam insulated. Mm -hmm. So that's it. it pre-insulated, one piece cover polyethylene. So when we take it out of the mold, we slice it, we get a base, we put insulation in it, and then we take a finished tank and we put it on the base. So now the bottoms of the tanks are insulated, uh, the top cover's insulated, and they're gonna put insulation on the sides. That's the tank, we've got the burners, that cover, which is the base, that's gonna bolt on. This thing's gonna rotate around in a big circle, uh, which you know, that plastic is tumbling, but then it tilts back and it tilts forward to put the coating on the bottom and the, and the top. The wall thickness on the top is about 3 8 of an inch thick. Down at the bottom, it's about 3 quarters of an inch thick. So we time it, we keep it in the back position longer to make it thicker down at the bottom. What's, what's the driving force? Well, I mean, you know, to me, we've been doing thermal storage for a while, but it yeah. still hasn't touched the potential. Mm -hmm. So we have to get to the people that are paying the bills. Uh, and you know, get them to look at doing it a little bit different way. And there's no compromise with our system. You're not giving anything up. It's completely transparent to the owner. We shift that major demand and nothing has changed for the occupant of the building. They don't know it. What is the uh, smallest capacity uh, chiller you've seen these installed connected to? Uh, well, the smallest kind of building we've ever done is like a McDonald's in, in Geneva, Switzerland. Really? Uh, yeah, so we can do we can do pretty small. We're looking at other even smaller stuff for mm. applications like maybe cell phone towers or something of that of that nature. Mm -hmm. We got a uh, we got our uh, skating rink going into Wrigley Field. <laughs> so these are three model tanks. We pick the one that's going to work right. There's ice in these tanks now. With, um, without a load, how long does the ice hold? Uh, so if we charge these tanks up, uh, they would still have ice in them 90 days later. So our losses are about 1% per day. So we have the pumps, we've got all the valves, we have all the sensors, we have all the controls, we have the glycol management system, we have a heat exchanger, right? right? So Everything is here, so when this, the tanks and chiller get to the site, they have to connect two pipes from the tanks to the package, two from the chiller to the package, and then two from the package to the building, and they gotta give it power, yes. and we're done. I hate to say this, but it's almost like a plug and play. <laughs> it is exactly a plug and play. So you have a gold uh, lead certification here. Yeah, yeah I'm gonna do some research. You do a lot of work with lead? Well, I was the chairman of the board. Okay, yeah. Has it achieved uh, some of the, the progress that they were hoping for when they, they started the whole initiative? Lead, absolutely. Um, let's see, when I was there, we were trying to break 2 billion square feet. Mm -hmm. uh, now I think they're up at you know 12 or something. I mean, they're way, way up. It, it, it brought the words, the definition, the understanding of what these issues are. So if the building was silver or gold, it doesn't matter. You're talking about the impacts, okay. you know. Um, the language, you know, of green was really developed and we could start talking in a uh, more uniform way about it. Yeah, I mean, thank you once oh, again for welcome. being with us. You're welcome. Thanks for, I mean, thanks for coming by. Yeah. This yeah, is terrific. Really nice yeah. to meet you. Uh, yeah.